Welcome to our first De Gruyter book talk. Today uh, we will talk about the book The Forgotten Massacre, Budapest 1944, with the brilliant professor Andrea Pedro. Andrea, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Thank you very much for the invitation and for all your work which made this book possible. No, it was, it was your work, first <laughs> and foremost, but thanks. So this talk will uh, will start off with a, um, a brief introduction of Andrea Pitto of um, the book, and then we'll jump straight into the talk. Professor Andrea Pitto is a historian um, and professor at the Department of Gender Studies at Central European University in Vienna, Austria, a research affiliate of the Central University, um, Central European University Democracy Institute in Budapest, and a doctor of science of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Her works on gender, politics, Holocaust, and war have been translated into 23 languages. And in 2018, she was awarded the 2018 All European Academies Madame de Stael Prize for Cultural Values. She is Dr. Honoris Causa of Soderton University in Stockholm, Sweden. And her most recent publications include um, the Women of the Arrow Cross Party, Invisible Hungarian Perpetrators in the Second World War, published in 2020 by Palgraf Macmillan. And of course, the book we are going to talk about in a minute, um, show it again, uh, The Forgotten Massacre, Budapest 1944, was published just a couple of weeks ago by De Gruyter. She also writes up ad pieces for many international and national media and anchors the CEU podcast on the history of the Second World War. So today, as already mentioned a couple of times, we will um, talk about the latest book, The Forgotten Massacre, which discusses um, a formerly unknown and invisible massacre in Budapest in 1944, which was committed by a paramilitary group led by a woman. Andrea uncovers the gripping history of the first private Holocaust memorial that was erected in Budapest in 1945. And based on court trials, interviews with survivors, perpetrators and investigators, the book illustrates the complexities of gendered memory and of violence. And it examines the dramatic events, the massacre, deportation, the robbery, the homecoming and fight for memorialization from the point of view of perpetrators and survivors. So the book is an um, incredibly interesting read, because that, which is not that common for a historical book, right? Because you, you write it in a way that um, makes it easy to understand and also makes one keep reading. You basically don't want to put the book down until you're finished with it, which is, yeah, just brilliantly written. Um, and my first question for you would be, um, how did you find out about the case? What alerted you to it? And what made you write the book? What was the reason for this? Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really honored uh, to do this uh, book talk. So I uh, was uh, working on a book project uh, which was uh, based on uh, interviews of uh, contemporary conservative far-right and neo-nazi women in 2000 and i was wondering this was the first urban government when we first recognized that there is a mushrooming of uh, women's activism uh, uh, in hungary but not the uh, liberal human rights based activism but they were speaking a very different language. They had very different uh, uh, agenda. And I was wondering, where did these women come from? So I did these interviews with them. And I would like to, again, thank for the trust, because it was pretty obvious that I'm not one of them. And still, they were spending time with me to talk about why did they join politics. And by now, these women actually became prominent uh, members of the uh, uh, illiberal uh, regime in Hungary, but at that time they were just entering into politics. And when I was sitting in their living room, I was, uh, I felt I was in 1938, 1939. So as if uh, the 
70 years of communism hadn't had happened, as if the uh, Holocaust had not have happened. And more importantly, the people's tribunals hadn't had happened. So the people's tribunals were those uh, institutions which were set up uh, after the Second World War at the institutions of uh, transitional justice to make a clear line, you know, what is good, what is not good, what is not acceptable, like deporting uh, 430,000 Hungarian Jews, mostly to Auschwitz-Birkenau, is not acceptable, for example. And also killing Hungarian Jews in uh, Hungary, this is also not acceptable. But sitting in those living rooms, doing these interviews, this was as if it hadn't happened. And that's uh, which uh, prompted me to work on the people's tribunals, to look at the case files, uh, looking at the uh, files of the female uh, uh, perpetrator, simply asking the question, what went wrong? And that was the book which was, uh, 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 which uh, the book came out from this you mentioned in the introduction that the female perpetrators uh, of the Arrow Cross Party. And when I was giving a public talk about uh, my research, of course, it's full of confidence, right? That I know everything about the women of the Arrow Cross Party. Then after a talk, uh, a elderly, gray-haired uh, man came to me and asked the question if I have heard his name, Piroshka Deli. And of course, with full confidence, I said, of course, I mean, she was the, uh, if you read any book about the uh, uh, arrow cross rule in Hungary, which um, maybe we should open a bracket here and explain uh, the listeners, what is that? So Hungary was an ally of uh, Nazi Germany uh, till uh, the 19th of March, 1944, when uh, Germany occupied Hungary uh, because Hungary was trying to sign a separate armistice with the Allied forces, because by that time it was pretty obvious that Germany lost the war. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, the uh, botched attempt of Admiral Horty on the 15th of October 1944 actually uh, prompted uh, a coup and the Arrow Cross, the Hungarian Nazi party took over. Uh, and this date, the 15th of October 1944 will come up later in this podcast, but um, uh, the, the arrow cross rule between the 15th of October 1944 and the 4th of April 1945, when Hungary was uh, occupied by the Red Army soldiers, is the so-called arrow cross rule. Again, an important footnote that the deportation of the Hungarian Jews happened before that, uh, during the uh, uh, the uh, April, May, and early June uh, of 1944. So bracket closed. So uh, I was just, uh, you know, I was very confident because if you read any historical book about this brief period, right, the October 15th, 1944, and 4th of October, and the 4th of April, 1945, uh, there are seven women who are mentioned who were executed as uh, representatives of the Arrow Cross Party who were participating in the killings. One of them is Hiroshka Deli. So I responded with clear confidence that, you know, of course I know. And then he said, I met her. And this sentence, right, it actually changed the whole perspective. And uh, uh, he invited me to this uh, group of survivors, meeting to meet with a group of survivors uh, who uh, became the uh, main inspiration for this book. And let me thank to her, uh, to, uh, to the whole group as, uh, uh, as supporting my, my project writing this book. Uh, and then I started to look into this particular case, the Delhi Piroshka case. And um, this, this is one inspiration. And, and the other inspiration is that what's happening in Hungary now, the memory politics, the liberal memory politics, which actually this revisionism of uh, the responsibility of the Hungarians uh, in the uh, massacres and the killings of uh, Jews and the looting and uh, uh, of, of the Jewish uh, citizens, which the other political inspiration, that, because that kind of revisionism uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, should be fought with facts and also with books, which are written in a style that not only those 25 historians will be reading it, who <laughs> need to read it because of their professional reasons. Exactly. That's actually, I think that's a fascinating story. And it's part of your book. You explain in the beginning, in the introduction, uh, exactly that. And I think that that's something that makes this book so compelling. Because the how you came about the story in the first place is a great story. Um, and since um, we we talked about uh, Delhi um, as well, and her being one of seven, I think uh, you said, um, uh, women of the party, I was wondering if um, about the gender aspect in general. So is it different to research a female perpetrator? Because we mostly used to um, yeah, find out stuff, study male perpetrators. Um, so that, that would be one part of the question. Is, is there any difference you have to, to think about while researching it? Um, and also, um, I wasn't sure if the, um, the kind of choosing Delhi as one of the main uh, perpetrators at the time, um, was that done to, to foster a specific agenda? So wouldn't, if she was not only a woman, but also a mother, I think, um, didn't that make it harder than say, for instance, um, choosing a male perpetrator to convict, um, maybe even one that was in, in uniform, because I, I think there were people um, being seen there in, in German uniform. Wouldn't that have been easier? Um, but yeah, that, that would be part of the question too. Thank you. So maybe uh, I would start with the case. So why, what, is, what, what happened on the 15th of October 1944? What is this forgotten massacre? And then I will respond to the part of uh, uh, the, uh, the gendered forgetting as far as the uh, uh, People's Tribunal uh, is concerned and also about why this is called the forgotten massacre so what exactly. made it why what made it uh, forgotten so what happened on so 15th of october is an important date in the hungarian uh, historiography because the, on the 15th of october 1944 uh, admiral horty broadcasted on this beautiful sunny day uh, a speech on radio saying that uh, Germany lost the war and Hungary is uh, looking uh, uh, to uh, forward to sign an armistice with the Allied forces. And that prompted uh, the uh, Arrow Cross takeover later that day. That was a Sunday. And uh, uh, by that time, the Jews in Budapest were forced to live in houses marked by yellow Star of David. So there was a forced relocation uh, of um, uh, uh, more than 100,000 Jews uh, in different cramped apartments. And uh, uh, the uh, 46 of Cengeri Utsa, which is close to the octagon, for those who are familiar with the uh, topography of Budapest, which is in the center of, of Budapest, that was a house uh, marked with the yellow star. And... Uh, uh, the tenants were uh, uh, all Jews, of course, uh, but the janitor family was a Gentile family. And uh, at uh, sometime around seven-ish in the evening, uh, there were uh, uh, a car or a truck stopped, we don't know exactly, and there were several uh, uh, men in uniform uh, appeared at the, uh, at the uh, gate, uh, allegedly led by a woman uh, who was uh, uh, very possibly uh, Piroshka Deli. And then this uh, group of men and this woman uh, massacred 18 to 21 uh, uh, inhabitants of the house and then force them to leave the house and try to uh, send them to a, a collecting place where they hope they will be deported to, uh, to uh, possibly to Auschwitz. And 
this massacre, which has, you know, uh, it, it's already, it, I signal that there are so many things we don't know, and that complexity of the stories is really interesting, that what are those elements we don't know, and uh, uh, what are the uncertainties, um, uh, actually uh, was an un, uh, kind of um, uh, extraordinary event, not only because of happened on the 15th of October 1944, but because at that time it was not a uh, it was not acceptable. It was not an opus of uh, modus operandi to kill people in their own apartment. And so this is the event, right? And uh, uh, then uh, after the, the war, several survivors returned, not only because this deportation, uh, which the uh, this uh, paramilitary or military uh, man and the woman hoped to happen, did not happen, but also because uh, in November there was another way of deportation. And again, several from them, from uh, those who were deported, returned. So there were several survivors who actually returned to the house and they wanted to have justice. And this uh, justice meant uh, that they were actively looking for uh, ways to identify those who were killing and uh, also to try to get back their property from the janitor's uh, family, because obviously the janitors were immediately robbing the houses, uh, the apartments of the uh, Jews who were uh, who were deported, and uh, and also some of the some of the tenants uh, let gave uh, their property to the janitors for safekeeping. Surprisingly, they haven't received them back. So this is also another story of the book, the, what happened with the property in, the, in that particular house. But uh, uh, then, uh, interestingly, Piroz Kadeli showed up and walked on the streets after uh, the uh, Red Army uh, occupied Hungary, and somebody recognized her and reported to the police. So this trial was one of the first trials of the People's Tribunals, and on that trial, uh, uh, one of the survivors uh, recognized the story because it turned out that this was not the only house they were robbing on the 15th of October, 1944, but they did that in previous uh, houses, but in previous houses, they were not uh, killing uh, the uh, inhabitants. So uh, that's... Uh, prompted the, uh, the, uh, one of the survivors uh, to report this massacre as uh, to, the, to the people's tribunals, which very quickly uh, 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 came to a conclusion that she was the, uh, the main person to be convicted because no other perpetrator had been found. And uh, uh, she was then portrayed as the arrow cross beast. Right, so for the communist propaganda, it was really very useful to have a woman who was divorced, the husband cannot be seen, there were two children which cannot be found, uh, simply hinting a kind of loose morality, which fitted into this uh, uh, normalization attempt of the uh, of the uh, communist uh, uh, Hungary, namely that the arrow cross were this kind of working class, non-reliable, uh, underclass criminals. And if we com convict them, then everything will be just fine. And then we don't need to look at the structural collaboration of the Hungarian state with Germany. So in that sense, this uh, trial fitted into this um, stereotypical image that the arrow cross women are these loose moral beasts who are killing people. But uh, the problem was that uh, uh, Piroz Kadeli had nothing to do with the arrow cross party. Uh, that's why the, uh, the survivors very consciously tried to make this linkage between the Arrow Cross Party and uh, Piroz Kadeli in order to convict her and to make this conviction uh, kind of serious. And this kind of portraying of women as beasts, uh, this, is, this has a tradition. This has a tradition because if you look at the perpetrator studies, we see that it started from looking at women as beasts. Uh, 
uh, who, were, who, were, uh, who were killing. And uh, this is on the one hand, of course, the first necessary step, but on the other hand, this makes invisible those structural factors which are uh, uh, which contribute to uh, to the fact that women find it attractive to use violence and to kill uh, to achieve their aims. So, um, from a previous study we did with uh, Ildiko Barna, uh, uh, a book, uh, "The Political Justice in Hungary After the Sec in Budapest After the uh, Second World War," which was published by the CU Press, we looked at fifty-four thousand cases of the people's tribunals in Budapest with quantitative methods. And we could basically very confidently argue that women usually receive lighter sentence in the people's tribunals because they played the gender card, that they were misled and somebody told them uh, that they should be you know, doing these things and they just follow the order of their partners, their husbands, their brothers. In this case, uh, Piroz Kadeli was uh, uh, convicted because first, she did not have a paid lawyer and she was unable to play this gender card. Uh, so uh, I analyze in length uh, in the book how, this, uh, how she changed from one hearing to another her testimony. But basically, uh, she did not speak the language of the court. And uh, unlike other uh, female perpetrators who very often committed very same crimes that she did in other uh, parts of the, uh, uh, of the country, but they spoke the language and they could say that we, I was told, I was forced. And then the people's tribunal said, okay, then six years of imprisonment. And then after two years, they were out. But that's an extraordinary case in that sense that, uh, you know, she was a, uh, she was not an educated uh, 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 woman, so she did not know how to deal with authorities. That's interesting. That first of all, she was there because of the gender stereotype, being the beast, um, and then um, not a, a being able to apply the gender role to get a lighter sentence. And then also, I, I think she she uh, got um, cancer in the end, or it was. Um, I don't know if, if that played a role in, in her sentencing as well, because she was terminally ill. So maybe it was easier to then execute her as well. No, it, it, no, no I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, uh, she was uh, uh, diagnosed being pregnant. And that's why they haven't executed her uh, when she should have been executed. But uh, uh, the People's Tribunals and all this uh, legal machine was working in an extremely low, lousy way. So uh, even for the, this uh, system, uh, it became clear that um, uh, more than nine months passed and she hasn't delivered the baby, so there must be something wrong. And then they sent her uh, according, uh, uh, at that time she had been already in the 13th months of her mm -hmm. pregnancy uh, to a, uh, an examination when it turned out that uh, uh, she, uh, uh, she, uh, she has a, a cancer. And uh, then she was executed. Mm -hmm. So uh, because it <laughs> after 13 months, there was no baby. So uh, that's again a, a story. What happens when a, a, a criminal is, is pregnant and they, yeah. he's expected to, to be executed? What happens with the baby? But this was not the case here because she was just... Uh, uh, just uh, uh, sick with an ovary cancer. Yeah. Um, and to, to go into the, the um, cases of forgetting a little bit more, um, uh, throughout the book, the, the categories of forgetting, remembering, memory, collective memory um, are uh, crucial ways to, to understand the case. Um, and I even argue they, they might be crucial for almost any uh, and every historical case you look at. Um, but especially since you're relying on testimonies as much um, and perpetrator testimonies maybe as well, because um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, so, it's, it's much easier to question um, a testimony or a story of a perpetrator than that of a survivor or victim. Um, that's, that's much harder to do. But of course, memory is always 
um, something that changes over time and that is also depending on whom you speak to, when you do so, and um, yeah, what, what, what circumstances you're in. And also what, what you, how you edit your story, be it consciously or not consciously. So um, my question would be, what, uh, what's the difference between um, forgetting uh, and editing and how did you try to figure out the difference? So how, how could you tell um, or maybe make an assumption about was the memory something uh, when it changed? when you read uh, it after, I don't know, months later or weeks later, and it was suddenly a different one. Um, could it have been a consciously edited um, testimony at that time? Or was it something that just, you know, when, when you have a memory and you push, uh, you, you convince yourself that it happened this way, but then after a certain amount of time, you think you know that it happened another way and it's just, it's, it's a natural thing. It's, it's sub consciously done um, and that must have been a hard thing to to figure out in the in the research process I assume um, so yeah but maybe let's let's go into the categories um, of, of forgetting remembering and also of, of memory and, and how to to unravel the effects um, behind it yeah this is a fantastic question that's the center of the book that how to uh how to, basically, how, how to reconstruct what has happened. And uh, uh, there are facts and there are stories about the facts. So be, uh, no matter that uh, I spent several years trying to um, research uh, the history of this massacre and I read uh, uh, the court trials. And there are actually two court trials, uh, one the uh, Piroshka Deli trial and then the trial of the janitor's family later on. Uh, I was uh, interviewing the survivors several times, and I also interviewed the janitor's family. Uh, and uh, from this very complex matrix, uh, what I can say is that uh, uh, there are several uh, uh, so, so why is this a forgotten massacre? Because I mean, that's, uh, that's the, uh, uh, the, the title of the book. So on the one hand, it received lots of uh, uh, publicity in 1945 and uh, as a first trial of the of the People's Tribunal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it received an iconic status and this iconic status was basically uh, omitting, whitewashing so many elements, crucial elements of this uh, of this story uh, that uh, uh, both the perpetrators and the survivors were unhappy and totally unsatisfied with the way how this story is being told. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, I'm using these uh, testimonies. I'm using the different um, uh, uh, testimonies in front of the people's courts, uh, also uh, the interviews I made and the interviews the survivors gave in different occasions. And you see, uh, not surprisingly, this is well known in the in the in the literature how the uh, testimonies are becoming canonized, and how a certain story is being told and repeated from the 1980s onwards. And here is a very specific element of the Hungarian Holocaust uh, memory, uh, namely that after 1989, uh, instead of opening up that. You know, there are lots of possibilities of retelling the story. This is actually closing down uh, because uh, 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 I haven't mentioned that uh, this uh, massacre is also interesting because the survivors erected the first Holocaust memorial in Budapest already uh, on the 15th uh, of October 1945. And uh, from 1989 onwards, uh, the main concern of the survivors is to protect that monument, that plague uh, in the house, uh, because uh, the other tenants in the house who uh, partly moved in uh, because the previous tenants were killed, uh, partly because they just uh, moved in because of in the 1960s, totally being unaware of the bloody history of that house. 
wanted to get rid of that plague because they afraid that the uh, far right militia and the far right uh, 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 paramilitary organizations uh, in Hungary will attack the house again. So uh, and that's interesting how these stories are um, uh, again becoming defensive in an allegedly democratic country and they are not feeling them the survivors, they don't feel themselves safe and protected. And the other side of the story is that the different Jewish organizations are, were not open uh, to, uh, to take part in this memorialization process. And we also know that the Holocaust research infrastructure in Hungary is really, really weak in some periods, uh, totally uh, non-existent after 89. So basically uh, the infrastructure is also missing uh, to create security for those uh, who want to tell their uh, stories. So when we are speaking about forgetting and uh, omissions, uh, on the one hand, there are obvious stories which are out there that Delhi's name is mentioned in every textbook, uh, which is discussing this period. On the other hand, uh, behind that name, there are so many stories and so many uh, omissions. And uh, this book is discussing the structural elements and also the, uh, the blind spots in the historiography and uh, the historical research, which actually made this uh, massacre uh, forgotten. Could you maybe explain about uh, the term collective memory? Well, oh, that's a that's a <laughs> that's a that's a very complicated uh, uh, term and very contested term. Uh, but uh, basically, the book wants to uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, explain and to give another uh, layer to this uh, uh, little bit uh, simplistic. Uh, uh, understanding of uh, collective memory to contrast it with the different memory cultures which are emerging in Hungary. So I started this podcast uh, or this uh, recording with uh, explaining how I was sitting in the living room of the far right and neo-Nazi uh, female politicians uh, in 2000, 2001. Uh, and the way how they were uh, telling their family stories was of course very different than my family story. So I was just wondering where there are so many pillarized memory cultures out there and how this kind of collective memory uh, is expected to solve all the problems. And uh, the educational activity, the political speeches, the interventions in the, in the public uh, discourse are all going towards this so-called collective memory, which is kind of flying in the air without real connection to the citizens and the people who are actually uh, having their own past. And they mm -hmm. were very much left alone in the family circles to think through, to talk about uh, this kind of uh, uh, what happened in the family during the Second World War. And this kind of pillarized uh, uh, memory culture has got very serious consequences for today's Hungary as well, uh, when we see the uh, kind of uh, uh, the Kulturkampf, this uh, kind of fight of different values uh, happening because they are, they have got very deep roots and the deep roots are connected very much to how the, uh, uh, the experiences, the very different experiences of the, of the Second World War. Just let me give you one example. So the collective memory is a very uh, problematic term. The, the example I would like to give is uh, uh, the uh, when you are interviewing uh, uh, Hungarian and for another project, I it interviewed several uh, 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 Hungarians about the memory of the when did the Second World War start for them? And this sounds like a pretty easy uh, question, but it turned out that most of the Hungarian population, the Second World War started when the Red Army came close, right? Mm -hmm. And for them, the deportation of the, of the Jews, their neighbors, their friends in some cases, was not connected to the Second World War. It was just, you know, just happening by the way. But the real beginning of the Second World War was when the uh, Red Army occupied Hungary. 
So, uh, and in a sense, it's a very different um, uh, memory culture for those who actually, from the 1920s onwards in Hungary, experienced the political anti Semitism and the anti Jewish legislation and the deprivation of rights, property, dignity, and then from their lives. So, this kind of very different losses, very different um, uh, uh, discussions are, are not meeting. There's very little interface. And that's why I was interested in the People's Tribunals, because that was expected to be the place where this interface is happening right after the, the war. And uh, that's why it's really interesting to see the, how these um, institutions work, uh, work, because then you see the failures then you see the glitches, then you see what went wrong. And uh, the impact of this book, hopefully, uh, not only that, that you know, if you start reading, you cannot stop it because it's really like a crime story, uh, with not a happy ending because I cannot really tell what happened during that uh, fateful night of the 15th of October, 1944. Uh, but uh, the, the, the impact of the book is that... Uh, uh, the very different uh, memory cultures in, in Hungary interpreted the book very differently. So on the one hand, it was celebrated as a, a pioneering book, which is discussing uh, uh, totally new topics with uh, fantastic uh, uh, theoretical and methodological uh, uh, equipment. On the other hand, uh, it, uh, on the uh, conservative far right, uh, they were celebrating this book, which proves that the people's tribunals operated in a non-efficient, lousy way and uh, innocent women were convicted because there were no convincing uh, uh, proofs and uh, the testimonies are unreliable. So it's a difficult position for the, for the author as well, because mm -hmm. uh, the book is out there. You know, the author is dead. So what is the afterlife of the book? Uh, but uh, I did what I could. And um, I hope that uh, this will be a, an interesting reading for those who are interested in the complexities of uh, gendered memories of the Second World War. Definitely. Definitely. I think so, too. Um, and I was just quickly um, to, to uh, the, the, one of the last questions I, I had. Um, and maybe that doesn't doesn't need an, uh, a long answer. So there there was a, um, a specialty to Hungary's approach to Holocaust studies. If you compare it with I don't know Austria maybe, um, or even other Eastern European states like Poland, did that play a role in how the, the memory of the massacre was depicted throughout the years between the end of the Second World War and um, eighty nine? Yes, yes, uh, that's a very important question that if we compare it with Austria, uh, of course, the difference is that Hungary was a part of the Soviet bloc. And in the Soviet bloc, uh, the main discourse was the anti-fascist discourse, which basically did not give a space to Jewish victims. Uh, everybody who was killed was a victim of Nazism, independently of uh, uh, the uh, who, who, what kind of victims and in what kind of uh, uh, context. And uh, this anti-fascist uh, kind of red carpet was put on all the victims and then it created this massive victimology. If we compare it with Poland, that's a different uh, difference. Uh, because uh, Hungary was the ally of, uh, of uh, Germany and uh, Poland was occupied by the uh, Nazis uh, already in 1939. So then we see the, uh, uh, a very different uh, context, and, uh, but there is one common point, namely that the local perpetrators and the sensitivity as far as the uh, research of the local uh, collaborators and perpetrators is concerned. So we also know that in Poland uh, uh, there is this debate now about the uh, 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 role of the uh, uh, different uh, Polish uh, 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 perpetrators and those who were collaborated with 
completely uh, occupying German uh, forces. In Hungary, uh, this debate is uh, very much under the radar because from 2010, because of this illiberal turn, the official uh, historiography is uh, presenting Hungary as a victim of both the German occupation and the Soviet occupation. So this double victimhood uh, basically makes uh, uh, the Hungarian collaboration and the Hungarian perpetrators invisible. Uh, and uh, this kind of invisibilization of the perpetrators uh, is especially true as far as the uh, so-called ordinary uh, perpetrators, the ordinary citizens, the ordinary men and women are concerned mm -hmm. uh, because the high profile uh, perpetrators, uh, they were convicted and they have a name, right? And of course you can debate uh, certain uh, uh, responsibilities, but uh, those who just uh, uh, wanted to get the fur coat of their neighbor and reported that uh, uh, to the uh, authorities uh, and then the the neighbor was uh, uh, deported and they were just looting the apartment and uh, there were no survivors who could report uh, uh, this to the people's tribunals then this will re uh, remain uh, undetected so uh, basically the whole process of the uh, of the compensation and also the uh, of the, uh, the lustration of uh, the massive lustration of the uh, of the population did not really happen very successfully, and that's uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, this is a, a very specific case. Mm. And it's also an example for um, memory that's made politically acceptable by the state, and to to have something that's acceptable for the country to to hang state um, commemorations on. Exactly, and that's why I think this story is interesting because it shows that this, this story always uh, remains a blind spot. So from wherever you see, <laughs> it remains it remains a blind spot. So because uh, uh, this uh, uh, the lo logic of the communist uh, legal system, then you, they portray this beast who committed the uh, crimes. But in the Cold War logic. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, particular uh, crime uh, was not that important as other crimes, right? And also, the, this ordinary men and ordinary women remained under the radar. And also, the issue of the restitution, right? That's again something which is a blind spot. And also, this uh, uh, the anti-fascist logic. Right, that it also makes it in, invisible, and also the post 1989 this double victimhood that makes it invisible. Uh, and I also have to say that the research, the previous research, also made this invisible because both the perpetrator studies and the fascist studies, uh, basically looking at the important man, so they are not interested in the in the gendered aspects of. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, of these kind of questions still very recently. So there are so many uh, blind spots this book tries to uh, fill in with a kind of um, easily understandable and accessible language. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, it's a, a brilliant study um, about the gender memory politics, Jewish history at the time in Hungary and Holocaust at the same time. And it's... Um, easily understandable but but still um yeah brilliantly researched so yeah it's, it's a great book and, and the, the very last thing and um, because you touched upon it before is um so the, this this form of um memory that manifested itself um after the war uh, and also after 89 there, there might not be a direct link to today's politics and to Orban, but it, it maybe that it's one of the foundations of the reasons things are like they are today. What if you could do anything? Do you think that there's a possibility to to change it by changing the memory of things like like this massacre? 
um, I mean, what, uh, what historians can do that they are writing interesting books. They are doing research. I mean, I have spent years researching this uh, book. Uh, so uh, change can only happen if there are uh, uh, good, well-trained historians who have got paid time to do research in archives and to write fantastic books. And at the moment, this is not the case because obviously the liberal state and I'm sure that the listeners follow the uh, developments in Hungary, uh, privatized the whole Hungarian uh, higher education out of 240,000 uh, uh, students of the higher education, only 20,000 remained in public education. The rest uh, were privatized into these dubious uh, 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 entities which are run by commissars uh, appointed by the, uh, uh, the government. And this uh, higher education uh, is basically controlling the content, controlling the personnel, uh, who, who will be teaching, who will be doing research, and what will be published. So, of course, uh, there are uh, several ways to survive this kind of um, illiberal uh, censorship, like with self-censorship. And uh, uh, not to speak out, not to write down, as the classical joke said about the communism, so don't think about it. If you think about this, don't put it down. If you have put it down, don't sign. And if you have signed it, don't be surprised. So this is actually coming back nowadays, and the self-censorship is something which is uh, uh, extremely dubious. But there are some good signs, like uh, there are fantastic young uh, scholars who were mostly uh, educated uh, by us, by the Central European University. And there are some other places which are actually hosted some uh, scholars, but they don't really have the means and the institutional support to do this kind of work. And uh, unlike the liberal, uh, historians, because never ever in the history of Hungary had been so much money invested in setting up historical research institutes. But what they are actually producing is a very dubious quality and, of course, serves the need of the memory politics of the liberal state. So here we have got a fight for the hearts and the minds of people and historians have got a very important task here and I just uh, as a privileged CU professor who is now living in Vienna as a political refugee I would say mm -hmm. I just cannot uh, speak more of those colleagues who are still in Hungary and who are doing uh, critical work and uh, this story I think is an important lesson for everybody or in Europe and in other countries, that this can happen to you. And uh, please, when you stand in front of the mirror, think about what did you do to prevent this happening? And if you have got a good answer, then that will be a good day. That's a perfect last sentence, actually. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's really important to also realize that things like that, the, the censorship and the self-censorship, that those things that, that happen in other countries too at the moment, not only in Hungary, but also in the US, of course, now in the, in the United Kingdom. And uh, we really need to be alert to it and, and, and stop it where we can. Um, so we need more books like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this. Okay. So that concludes um, our uh, book talk. Thank you so much, Andrea. It was wonderful to talk to you. Um, again, it's, a, it's a, one of the best books I've ever read, um, and, and I hope to read much more from you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for listening, too. Bye.